Feedback to the future. Forget the annual performance review. What we need instead is a new feedback culture that is consistent, respectful, and two-way. By Joanna Leggett. The annual performance review once struck fear and trepidation into the hearts of many employees. A yearly ritual involving the boss, all-knowing, all-powerful, handing down a report card on the worker's performance. Times have changed, or at least they are in the process of changing, according to Melbourne-based former accountant Georgia Murch, who now designs feedback cultures for organisations. Forward-thinking companies, says Murch, are moving to regular check-ins, often fortnightly or monthly, in addition to an annual performance discussion. She says, We now have so much data to prove that performance reviews in isolation don't work and they are quite demotivating for staff. Many companies are thankfully moving away from this performance review dependency to an informal check-in culture, which we know boosts performance by more than 60%. Yet we still have some way to go. Georgia Murch says, We're still nervous about giving feedback for many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that people worry it will impact the relationship. Yet evidence shows us, in fact, when we give feedback with good intent, the relationship actually improves. John Hattie, leading educator and laureate professor at the University of Melbourne's Graduate School of Education, says feedback serves to answer one of three questions. Where am I going? How am I going? And where to next? Most crucially, bosses need to focus on the third component, the where to next as the success of the feedback hinges on the outlining of a future course of action. Hattie notes, if you give no feedback on the question of where to next, despite a page of comments about the where and how the person is going, then the person won't hear it and will actually report that no feedback was given. He also urges managers to resist the temptation to insert praise during feedback conversations, as recipients tend to focus on the positive and ignore the areas for improvement. Separate praise from feedback. It can be given, but at a separate time, he says. Georgia Murch says some managers give feedback using a command and control approach, assuming their truth is always right. We do want people to be honest, but what I don't think people realise is, not only could they be wrong, but the way in which they are sharing that feedback can be quite damaging she notes. Merch recommends managers give clear examples to back up their feedback. We need to give others concrete examples so they understand where we're coming from and then our opinion makes sense, even if the person disagrees with it, she says. When giving feedback, the intention matters as much, if not more, than the content of the discussion. We need to ask, am I actually coming from a place of learning? Or am I coming from a place of being right, says Merch. If you are open-minded and curious, then the feedback content will naturally fall into place. Georgia Merch notes, people can tell if you're really interested in their perspective. The trick is to work out whether you're really leading by listening and if you're actually interested in other people, so that when you share feedback, the person feels they are part of the conversation. The concept of feedback, as John Hattie notes, has moved on from the notion that feedback is something that is delivered to an emphasis on the feedback being adequately received and digested. People think feedback is something you just give and then magically things happen, but it must be a dynamic two-way process. John Hattie notes, What we ask in assessing its value is, was the feedback heard? Was it understood? And was it actionable? If you can focus on the recipient, check they understand what you were saying. And if you get that part right, you can dramatically increase the effectiveness of feedback. Psychologist and corporate consultant Claire Mann agrees. She says it's imperative that the feedback conversation is approached with empathy for the other person. Rather than blaming someone for a misstep, she advocates that it is wise to consider whether they've had a tough time of late and what their version of events may be. Once you've provided feedback, Mann recommends checking that you are both on the same page 
by putting the responsibility on you, the issuer of the feedback, to make your points clear. She says, you may say, so that I can be absolutely sure I've made myself clear, could you put into your words what you think I meant by that? That way, if it's misunderstood, it's my fault because I didn't make myself clear. It's so subtle, but it makes a big difference. The choice of words is also extremely important, says Mann. Using we instead of you, for example, can change the tenor of the discussion. By using we, it does something neurologically in the brain. It creates a sense that we are solving the issue together, as opposed to, I'm perfect, but you need to get your act together, she says. If a specific issue needs to be raised, avoid the word why, as in, why didn't you do this? Because this puts the other person on the defensive. Asking instead what happened in a situation, and not why, gives a person the room to explain. For example, you could say to an employee, I noticed that you're missing deadlines. What is happening there? Mann also recommends focusing on asking open rather than closed questions, as this allows the deliverer of feedback to gather more information and bond with the recipient. Lots of open-ended questions give the other person the time to say what they need to say, and that investment is gold, because every time you give people your time as a manager, they're warming to you, she says. Despite your best efforts with communication and tone, feedback could be misinterpreted. John Hattie says sometimes the best solution is practical. In the workplace, sometimes the best form of feedback is simply to reteach the information, he says. Teaching would ideally come before feedback, as it is distinct from feedback. So if something isn't working, then teach it again. However, if it becomes clear that the feedback is routinely not being heard or taken on board, that is where you need to enter a dialogue. John Hattie says, but it shouldn't be, you misunderstood me, you're wrong, you're bad. It should be, let's have a dialogue. I need to improve what I'm saying here because I'm not making my suggestion to you to improve very clear, am I? Workplace culture within each organisation has an influence on the quality of feedback. John Hattie argues that companies should preference an improvement mentality over a change mentality culture. If I have a change mentality, then it comes down to whether a worker meets certain criteria, because all I want you to do is either change or not change, he says. An improvement mentality, however, avoids this duality, and the recipient realises that the feedback is not being given for any nasty or vindictive reason, says Hattie. If you're in a culture where the feedback given is all about improvement, then you'll want to know what you're not doing well, he says. Claire Mann notes that a robust work culture can act as a vital counterpoint to a human tendency to run from feedback, especially in tough times, such as an economic recession or pandemic. If we don't have a culture in which it's safe to give and receive feedback with an open mind and a genuine willingness to learn, it could become very personal. Then feedback can be perceived as an attack on identity rather than merely talking about an aspect of what someone is doing. Some managers may argue that remote working makes it hard to give feedback, but Georgia Murch disagrees. It's not the technology that makes feedback good or bad. It's the content and the intent, she says. We're all on the receiving end of feedback at one time or another, whether from our boss, our colleagues, or others in our lives. And of course, there will be times when this feedback will get under your skin. Merch says, in order to become good feedback recipients, we need to be aware of our triggers. It doesn't matter how much you teach people to give feedback, your feedback culture will be stifled unless you also teach people how to receive it, Merch says. If we become defensive when receiving feedback, we can't hear the point the other person is making. Our learning opportunities decrease, but also relationally, it has an impact on people wanting to ever give us feedback again. Claire Mann says that when we're annoyed or bothered by specific feedback, it's worth doing some self-detective work. Ask yourself, what is it about the feedback that specifically bothers you and give it an adjective 
or a label. Often it's not what has been said, it's the fact that the manager has not really listened to you, or it could be your own self-esteem, or that you're a perfectionist. Finally, remember at the end of the day, it's just feedback. We are so much more than our jobs, so try to separate what you do from who you are, says man.